Hello, good morning. So of course, like the rest of you, I didn't know it was in the keynote today, and it's very timely to talk about legacy apps in production, because that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, not necessarily exclusively legacy, but we all have apps, right? We all have existing stuff. And um, so anyway, I'm Brett. A little bit about me. I uh, am now a Longhorn writer, as of last night. And I've been a Docker user since around 2014 sometime. I think uh, I was a dev and ops user of it. We actually were using it in a co-founded startup that I'm in, and or was in. And the, the startup didn't work out, but our tech was awesome. So Docker was great, helped us out a lot. And that's when I started getting the bug for fun containers. And so now I'm an uh, independent. Uh, DevOps consultant, I guess you could call it. So I help people, I spend my time all helping people go to production Docker. So I thought I would wrap all that up over the last two years into some lessons learned and get into some actual practical stuff a little bit. So I'm assuming you're here because you want to go Docker production and not, I'm here, not here to convince you that production is a good idea. You hopefully did that before you got in here. And this is after you've made that decision and you're like, okay, now what's next? How do we, how do we actually do that? And so you've already used Docker, you're already actually probably using it in dev, or maybe even a little test, and you're taking that next step. And a lot of times, uh, the problems are you got these decision barriers you need to make, basically. They're, they're in your way because you need to make a, bunch of, a whole list of decisions. Some of those are actually true, and some of those are not actually real things that you need to do. Uh, they're sort of fictitious requirements that go into the project that uh, you think are mandatory. So we're going to discuss those and try to get some of those out of the way for you and break down some of those barriers. And hopefully I will help you. So here's our agenda. And we're going to get started. So who, stall, who saw the Star, Star Wars trailer? Anybody? Yeah. Woo! All right. I'm excited because after I'm a X-Gen, so that means now as an adult I can actually see what happened to Luke. <laughs> uh, so I'm here to give you sort of a new hope around containerizing as is, or as close to what you currently do as possible. And uh, basically in your projects, the goal here is that every decision point, uh, question if that thing that you're about to decide on needs to change for the sake of deploying a container. Because containers are fundamentally not a whole lot different. It's still a process running on an OS, right? So sometimes we put these decisions in that we have to make that aren't actually necessary. And I just call this limiting your simultaneous innovation. So it's a fancy phrase of basically saying, reduce scope, limit the things you're doing, and there's problem areas that I commonly see people dealing with and uh, that they don't necessarily need to make a part of this project when they're going production. And fully automatic uh, continuous integration and deployment isn't actually a requirement. It might seem obvious to a lot of you, but uh, I see a lot of cases where just because you have to actually go in and maybe type some Docker commands, and you maybe want to automate all that. If it's not automated today, it doesn't have to be for containers. Containers can operate just fine without them. And uh, scaling is another issue where people want to do all the things at once, right? We want a microservice, we want to fully uh, scale up and down, and we want to uh, deploy all that stuff magically. And these aren't actually container requirements. This is you just adding projects into this existing project and slowing down your production. So, we have service discovery issues where people are thinking they need to implement service discovery for their first three servers <laughs> or something like that. And that's, not a, that's another requirement that's not a hard set requirement. Uh, if you're not familiar with service discovery, it's usually when you get to containers and agile deployments, you start having challenges around things changing locations. And uh, that's definitely something you're going to have to deal with eventually. Swarm helps you a lot with that. But uh, it's not something that you necessarily need to uh, add as a hard requirement, you just kind of need to experiment and figure out if you can get, a, get around it for the time being. Because the goal here is to just get into production and then start the learning process, because you're going to learn a ton on day one and, and so forth. So let's make it happen faster, right? Persistent data is uh, not a huge deal if you're not trying to do a whole lot of magic with it. So the nice thing is now we have new, uh, new stuff out in the market. We have problems that are being solved all the time with persistent data. But don't make that your first thing, right? Maybe do the web front end or the API part and leave your databases where they're at. So as we've just heard for the last couple of hours, that legacy apps still work in Docker. Um, microservices is not another thing that 
uh, people love to think about converting to, and that was a great talk we just had, but it's definitely not required. I have tons of legacy apps running just fine in containers for my customers, and uh, even ones that are potentially 15 years old PHP apps, right? So I had one like that uh, last summer. So 12 factor, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is basically a set of design principles around how to be, how to develop in the modern uh, cloud era with agility, and you probably have heard about it, you probably are trying to follow it, but I just wanted to bring it up as a, uh, it's, it's a horizon. <laughs> it is not a destination, right? So with 12 factor, I see a lot of teams that are putting in these hard requirements around containers and associating that with maybe some of the 12 factor principles when those aren't required day one. So when you're, when you're trying to follow 12 factor, you're trying to get to there, just realize that that is an iterative process for the rest of your life to get your apps to the perfect 12 factor. And that uh, maybe we need a little bit of a recovery program for those of us that are uh, uh, 12 factor or die sort of attitude. So let's talk about some things that you need to do uh, up front. And the first thing I want to talk about is Docker files, because I think the Docker file is really the underpinning of your uh, infrastructure. And I would actually prefer you have better Docker files than fancy orchestration, because the Docker file itself, it might work in dev and uh, might work OK in uh, CI. But once you get to production, there are some things that we see that uh, sort of hang people up a little bit. So if you're not automatically building service today, and a lot of us aren't, a lot of us are still uh, sort of uh, manually, manually deploying uh, servers and configuring those servers. If you're in a smaller shop, that maybe is something that's not a big deal for you to automate because you don't do it a lot. But once you start Dockerizing, think of that Docker file as your first step into build documentation because you're now going to be able to see the steps on your server. So, uh, that's why it's good to put the documentation in there, and I love comments in Docker files. Uh, that, if you have an ops team that is new, maybe you got developers on Docker and you have an ops team that's new to Docker, that Docker file is one of the first things they're going to see to help them conceptualize how they're going to change their processes. And if it's a super fancy Docker file <laughs> with no comments, then that's just going to give them more challenges. So uh, I, I, I love Docker files that actually are simple. And maybe they're a little more verbose, uh, but they get the job done and they work just fine. And they're obviously starting from the official images. That's a good design goal when you first start out. Um, the official images uh, for all the packages on Docker Hub have been time tested for years now and are, very, are using all the best practices. And you can actually see in those Docker files and learn a lot from them if you inspect them. So let's go through some anti-patterns, because I think with Docker files, when you're going into production, there's specific things with Docker files that sort of pop out as issues, and it's easier to talk about what not to do than what to do, because most of us do a lot of good things in Docker files. But uh, some of the anti-patterns I see are trapping data. And so we have these volume commands that showed up a couple years ago, so that's definitely something that you want to um, use. And uh, this is a simple example would be that you have volume commands in your Docker file for all your persistent data. So databases are easy. You know where those database files are probably at. But what happens typically is we start practicing our routines of going into the production with the ops team, and then we're like, okay, we're going to take down this container and recreate it. We're going to put up a new image. And then lo and behold, a lot of times, there'll be some other form of data that they're, oh, maybe we want to keep that. You know, maybe it's uh, you know, debug files that dumped out of the process when it exited, or uh, you know, you probably shouldn't have log files st sitting in there, and so those sorts of things that you maybe don't think about until someone says, I want to delete it. <laughs> and then suddenly, oh, I realize there are things in there that aren't what we'd consider backup data, but important data that we want to keep just in case. So put that in volumes. Put extra volume commands in your Docker files. Keep it around. You may never use that data, and you'll just have it as part of your cleanup process, but having that in there is a, a key step. I think typically we end up starting to add volume lines as we learn in production where there's actually some potentially valuable uh, sort of temporary or debug or uh, data like that inside of some of the apps. So don't confuse this, by the way, if you're a developer with uh, bind mounts. Normally, that, that is a, not that you can't use that in production, but typically we see that uh, where you're mounting the host file system into the container uh, to the directory of your preference. Normally, that is done uh, for development purposes on your local machine. In production, it's probably a little bit better for you to use the volume commands than the bind mouse. Not that you can't, it's just sort of preferred, I think, from an ops perspective. 
no version pinning. So we all do this. I'm guilty of this. We all start with the latest. We just type in Nginx from image, and we start from there. So I really recommend you start with your from line, pinning that version, and uh, even on some of the images, there's actual dates of the build. So you can actually pin to the specific date that it was built on the label, or the tag, rather, so that you get a very specific image and you can control that. Because once you start iterating in production, if you're, if you're in a traditional shop where you're not, your VMs sit around for years potentially, you're not used to the idea that your app, your, basically your underpinnings are changing constantly. It's not just the app changing. So if you're changing your code, uh, you, know, you, you don't roll out random versions of your code. So don't roll out random versions of your uh, production packages. So once you get the from image pinned, I would recommend you start looking at your package deployments, your package manager commands in there, and you pin those as well. It's not actually hard to do. They all support it. And that's key to getting your production reliable so that when you change those images out on your application upgrades, you don't suddenly get new packages. So a lot of, a lot of teams end up realizing that their servers have the same packages for the last six months. Maybe they did security updates, but they weren't completely rebuilding servers all the time. And this sort of exposes that problem if you start just iterating in production without pinning. Uh, leaving the default config, and what I mean by that is your your PHP files, your Apache files, your Java memory, your MySQL settings, these are all in your Docker files, or at least they should be. And if you have VMs in uh, traditional architecture or bare metal machines, those settings might have been changed at some point by someone and not documented if you don't have a, a very strict build and uh, build process there. So what ends up usually happening is all this stuff works great in dev and CI, and then we get to production and we start hitting uh, performance problems. And it's usually because those settings aren't actually, the defaults are not great for production. <laughs> they work great on your machine, but they're not designed for production. So you definitely want to do that in your Docker file. Ideally, because your Docker file is your build, your build documentation, you don't want to just co blindly copy in uh, config files. I prefer that you actually specify this is all these changes and environment variables in your Docker file. And your Docker file might get a little long, but that puts all the information in one place and it makes it much easier to understand how you're changing things on the fly when you run them. And don't just take your VM configs for like MySQL or, or WordPress or whatever the, the settings are on the machine and just blindly copy those over because the file paths may change. If you change the from image that you're coming from, the file paths are probably going to be different inside that VM in, image than the VM, so that might break. Or the settings that might have been changed by someone in ops on your VMs, and you might not realize that uh, those settings weren't necessarily documented and you need to put them inside the Docker file instead of all the settings in the Docker file. So don't just copy blindly. I would compare them and see what the differences are from the defaults in the Docker image. So environment-specific stuff. Um, it's not a best practice to take your images and build them per environment. So this is actually a bad example. <laughs> Thumbs down on that cat. And this was a situation where they were building three different images for three different environments and copying in custom settings for that environment at build time, not at runtime. So ideally, you want your images generic enough with sane defaults so that you can use that image in dev, test, and prod, and you can change those settings on the run or in the service create commands, and that way you end up with one single reliable, I mean, the whole goal here is to reduce the change effect, right? So if you have one image, you can be certain that that image is the same in the three environments, and you're changing those options at runtime, and then when you end up with the fourth and the fifth environments, you're not making more images, you're just changing uh, config, fi uh, config values at runtime. So let's actually step back and talk about the production infrastructure for a little bit. The uh, decision that everyone has to make is, do I do containers on VMs or containers on bare metal? And we all probably, if you've been here long enough in this industry, you were on bare metal, and then you went to VMs, and now you're thinking, well, great, we're gonna have, we're gonna have to go back. So uh, I would say stick with what you know first. I think that was mentioned in the keynote. Uh, whatever you're doing today, it's gonna work fine. You don't have to force this change into, the, uh, into your project, and do some just generic basic performance testing, because not everything is gonna be performance uh, equivalent in a container, especially when you start stacking up containers on the same OS. If you're on VMs, you're probably putting one app in that VM. When you start doing containers, if you choose to start doing multiple containers in that VM, 
that's going to change the nature of how the kernel handles scheduling and all the all sorts of other little nuances like the storage drivers that affect the performance of the disk writes, writes and reads. Not necessarily all bad things, they're just different. So I would I would suggest that you maybe just spend a few days learning a little bit about basic, uh, it doesn't have to be super fancy, you don't have to go buy a product. Uh, a lot of the store, like database storage systems have open source testing tools that are pretty easy to use. We actually did some of this stuff at, with Docker and HPE uh, this quarter actually. So if you go to that uh, link there, I have, um, there's a white paper that I helped, I did all of the uh, actual Docker analysis on, and it basically was a sample config of how you could do MySQL benchmarking and then compare doing it in a VM, doing it in a VM with containers, and doing it in uh, bare metal, and the pros and cons of each and how that affects CPU scheduling, how that affects disk, and that sort of stuff. So it's not, no, there's no tweets in there that I can pull out, but it's basically lessons learned that you can sort of adapt and learn how you might want to do the performance testing yourself. All right, so Linux distributions, uh, they do matter, and since Docker is a pretty new technology and it really leans heavy on kernel features, I'm not gonna say it's unstable, but it's just there's, there's gonna be it, more issues that are gonna arise over your production lifecycle if you're on older editions of Linux kernels. So the minimum is, I think, still 3.10 uh, for running Docker, but it's not necessarily the one you want, right? So if you're on whatever Linux distribution you've chosen, Try to get to the newest version before you go to production, because you're probably going to end up with less issues later on once you start getting, uh, getting capacity and getting uh, a lot of better use out of your hardware. You might run into some issues that the kernel has maybe fixed since then. If you don't have an OS de decision, I'm not necessarily playing favorites here, but uh, if you, don't, have you d have no opinion about which distribution to use, I'm just going to tell you to use Ubuntu, the latest long-term stable release, so that you can get or long-term support. And that way you have years of support in it, they have a nice new kernel on the four, uh, four versions, and it's been well, well tested on the internet. So there's lots of people talking about it, and, and you're not gonna just end up with an empty Google search if you try to search potential issues you might have. So when people just ask me, well, what would you do? I just say, well, I would, I would do this because I've done it a lot, I know a lot of people that do it, and it works well. And if you're gonna get Docker for your distribution, don't use the default package manager in your servers. I do see that happens a lot, I think, with new people. They just think they'll just do a, uh, a package manager command for that package manager and install it. That's not going to get you the latest version. Docker iterates quickly. Now we're on a monthly schedule for the Edge release. So if you want to be on Edge or on Stable, those are still, Stables are still quarterly. So uh, you're going to need to use Docker's versions of those package managers, and you can get that from store.docker.com. Uh, they now have all of the distributions listed there that support Docker or that have, uh, yeah, that have package managers for them. So you can get them there pretty quickly. So. Now, once we've, got, once we've decided on the hardware layer uh, OS or the VM layer OS, let's talk about the distribution inside your images, right? So we talked about pinning it. And I wouldn't make the size of that image a priority in deciding which one you should use. I do see a lot of people getting very excited uh, about Alpine because it's a smaller distribution that's five meg in size, and that's really cool. Nothing wrong with it. It's just don't, don't make that decision you do on your first container deployment to production. Don't make that a requirement of the project because that's going to change all your build documentation because different distributions have different file paths and different package managers. So stick with what you know. Stick with the version you're using, the you know, addition, I guess, in, uh, of your distribution in your VMs. Stay with that. It'll work. Swarm architectures. So uh, there's a lot of best practices happening this week around Swarm, but I wanted to give you sort of a quick sound bite around what you're gonna do when you build out your Swarm. And what I would call these is good defaults. This is like the baseline where you would start from, and this is based on a whole lot of things, including real-world deployments I've done, uh, Docker's actual reference documentation and internal testing, as well as Swarm 3K. If you haven't heard of that, you should look it up. It's a pretty cool project. One of the Docker captains actually runs that, I think, about once a year now. And we actually connected 4,500 nodes around the world to the same swarm, and then we deployed Nginx and WordPress. And uh, it was a lot of fun, and we got a lot of analytics out of it about around how to scale swarm and how to deal with it. So I'm going to just start off with the world's best network diagram and tell you that this is a real thing. Let's not pretend that it's not, right? We all have single instance servers somewhere or some system that if it goes down, there's no fail safe. It happens, right? It's not a perfect world. And I just wanted to mention that Docker Swarm init still works on a single node. And why would you do this? Why would you have a single node swarm? Well, 
first off, you get new features that you wouldn't get, like secrets. So you can still use secrets on that server in a single node. Obviously, you got to back it up because it's not redundant, but it works if you have to do that. If you have an old legacy application that does not perform uh, well across multiple servers. So I see this. This happens. And what I would just suggest do this so that even if in like CI testing, your commands are the same, your processes are the same, and then once you get to production and swarm, uh, you're using the same stuff. So the three node swarm is the minimum you're going to get for HA. And it's all managers and workers, which means each node is actually doing the management of the system as well as running the containers for your application. But you can only have one node fail there, because after two nodes fail, then you can't manage the swarm anymore. Your containers are still run for your app, but you can't make changes to the swarm, right? High availability that I actually uh, recommend as a bare minimum is five. And these don't have to be huge instances because swarm managers actually don't, they are very efficient, right? It's all written in Go, it's all inside the uh, engine. So it's very efficient at what it does. And for companies that are actually gonna rely on this to make money, this is the absolute bare minimum I recommend. That way, one node you take out on maintenance and you're, you're working on maintenance and another node goes down, you're still, you're still fine. You, got, you still have management control and you're good to go. 10 is not a magic number, but after you get past five, I would recommend you split out your managers and separate them from the workers. So you basically just use some Docker Swarm commands to split these things out, and that way you can now dedicate workers and have more security control over your managers. And I'm just gonna throw in the, uh, anything beyond five, that's when you want to consider that. You don't want to do six or seven managers. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's a little bit unnecessary. I mean, do we really need to have three server failure? <laughs> um, maybe you do, but I, I have not seen a customer yet that I've worked with that had a legitimate use case for seven managers. And remember, on managers, only one is active. Uh, they're all talking to each other. Only one is using, doing the workload. So you're not getting more management capacity. That's really just related to your hardware and how many apps you have. That's not so much related to how many swarm managers you have. So constraints and swarm services are uh, how you control where your containers go. And it's not actually that hard. When you're getting started on swarm, you don't have to do a lot of fancy work to get your containers where they need to be. So these are some sample commands on how you would add labels to a node that maybe has unique hardware or a unique location, like in a DMZ. So the goal here is to have one swarm, not just one only, but reduce the number of swarms you need to have. So you can have different hardware in the same swarm. You can have uh, actually different operating systems in the same swarm, and you can have uh, them in different network segments. So when you would actually deploy your services, then you would do a simple little constraint that would basically tell it where to push that container, uh, that set of containers in the service. And that's what I, uh, our, my customers use basically, is if they have like SSD nodes and standard hard drives or DMZs and other networks, they just set these constraints up like that. It's pretty easy. So I'm just gonna throw out 100 node swarm in case you need to go there. Uh, you're probably not gonna change a whole lot from your five manager scenario. You're still gonna have them separated out. And the, you're gonna, at this point, you're probably gonna be complex enough that you have multiple actual like security groups or VLANs and that sort of thing. And you're still using constraints and labels to control where things are going. So it's not a whole lot that's changed. It's probably just your instance size that's changed. You probably got bigger instances and you just have more of them. So people ask me, like, when would I have a new swarm? How many swarms do I need? You know, where, you know, where are the decision factors around the swarms that I need to have? And so we just discussed not such a good reason for having a different swarms are the security groups or subnets or different parts of your network or different hardware configurations. Those are not good reasons for a new swarm. The good reasons for a, good, a new swarm are geographical differences. Ideally, you really want your single swarm to be in a, the same location. It doesn't have to be, it's not a hard requirement, but it does affect performance, obviously, when you have to send things over the wire. So you might wanna have your managers as close to your workers as possible. If you have security boundaries, like PCI, that's a pretty obvious reason for uh, obvious reasons. Uh, personal boundaries, personnel boundaries, rather. So if you have multiple ops teams or you have delegation of authority inside your ops teams and people that need to control Swarm, uh, out of the box, the Docker API does not provide you that granular uh, RBAC stuff. So you need to either create separate swarms and have you know, people with access to each one of those servers, or maybe use a, another product like Docker EE, which actually gives you the UCP uh, plugin. Basically, it's a website that 
allows you to do authentication and granular control. So you can give people read-only read access to your swarm, for example. And that's a part of that product. So externally driven deadlines. <laughs> what I mean about this is if you have a deadline that you did not control, which is often, but it's some arbitrary date in the future that you have to have your container swarm thing all set up and wonderfully working, right? Maybe it's Christmas shopping season and you have to containerize by then. So it turns out that actually the project managers for the Rebel Alliance at Yarvin 4 had an externally driven deadline called the Death Star that was looming on the horizon, right? Similar, you have a project deadline like this, you need to make some tougher decisions because you're gonna have to probably accelerate your learning path and get things even faster into production. So the first thing I see is the not implemented here syndrome. Uh, Kelsey Hightower actually tweeted about this recently and gave me the idea that this is actually a pretty cool uh, problem that actually keeps happening is that people want to make do it all themselves. They want to implement every part of their orchestration themselves. They want to implement every feature of their um, systems as themselves. So when I, when I see tough deadlines and we have to really uh, sort of decide what we're going to cut out of the project, we, uh, I usually look at what we can potentially outsource. I don't necessarily mean uh, you know, have it on the internet, it doesn't have to be there. I just mean a pre-built product that can solve that problem that you're not, not having to manage the entire environment and learn the whole product. So I use a couple of requirements there on that, like it's a well-defined uh, product market and there's a lot of good solutions for it and there's a lot of options and also they happen to be a feature of your infrastructure that is easily changeable, because that's key. Uh, you're gonna learn a lot and you might not want that product forever. So for your consideration, I would like to give you image registries that's a pretty defined marketplace. It's uh, not a lot of fun to run it yourself. Nothing wrong with running yourself. It's just a lot of extra work when there's already great stuff out there. And you're gonna have to deal with uh, image, uh, image storage and image cleanup, garbage collection, stuff like that, TLS and security stuff for your registry. So why not just use something else for now? Maybe later on you can decide to go into production with that. Log aggregation is the next big one. Uh, if you have 1705, which is the latest version that's about to come out, it's in uh, release client status right now, because it just came out last week. That actually has a new service logs command, so that can even get you started without a centralized logging system if you're really, if you're a small team and you don't have an existing logging system, but you just need to be able to get five nodes in one screen, that command can do it. It doesn't have a lot of features, so it's not gonna do a lot of long-term storage, it doesn't have a fancy search feature to it, but it does solve a problem for a basic swarm of getting uh, the logs on the one screen. And then monitoring and alerting. These are all places where the marketplace has uh, sort of matured and it's pretty easy to throw in a monitoring solution in an hour, honestly, you just, or a logging solution. You can, you don't, I'm talking obviously defaults, right? But if, you have, if you're using a SaaS product, that's the whole goal of them, right? Is they're easy to implement and easy to replace. Uh, they don't always do that, but <laughs> that's their goal. Uh, so you can do this without having to put that as a part of your project, and then maybe as a, a follow-on project, you decide to bring that in-house if you don't already have it, right? So Docker products that would actually help accelerate your decisions. Uh, the middle one here is Docker for AWS and Docker for Azure. I actually got this question this morning. Uh, if you're doing Docker on AWS or Azure, they actually have existing templates. If you just search Docker for Azure or Docker for AWS, you probably will see Docker's homepage for that. And those are in the store as well. And all they are is templates that are using best practices from those cloud providers, partnering with Google, or partnering with uh, Docker, and making infrastructure work. And actually the Google one is in, I think, beta right now. So this way you don't have to make all the decisions about the infrastructure. It helps you choose the OS, it helps you choose the network design, the security groups, that's all done for you. So that'll accelerate your decisions if you're on those platforms. The last one there is Docker EE, Docker Enterprise Edition. You can actually deploy that uh, if you have it, or on top of AWS, Docker for AWS and Docker for Azure, it'll, it'll work with those as well. So if you're going in-house on your own data center, it works. That solves a lot of problems that you're gonna have later, so it'll help accelerate your decisions because it's, it's implementing those solutions, like the layer seven proxy for HTTP and role-based authentication. And just a little reminder, um, as you mature in your infrastructure with these containers, your infrastructure is gonna iterate similar to your uh, code. So your infrastructure is not gonna stay the same for three years probably. And they had to iterate on the Death Star because the first one wasn't so great. And you're gonna have to do the same thing in your data center. So just a reminder that the first swarm you build is probably not going to be the best one. And that's okay, 
It's gonna, you're gonna get to work, and then you're gonna be able to create another swarm or make changes to that existing swarm. The nice thing about containers and swarm is they're designed around the modularity and being able to replace them very easily. So uh, whenever we wanna move to a new swarm, it's not a whole lot of work. Um, it's it's uh, quite frankly pretty easy there. So what if you even need a further acceleration? If, you, if your deadlines are just so ridiculous that you don't even know how any of this is gonna happen. So if you already have good infrastructure in place and you're automating today, or maybe you have uh, auto scaling enabled on your VMs, or maybe you love the security boundaries of VMs and you wanna keep those, I'm just gonna suggest one container per VM. I don't know why we don't talk about this more in the industry as a real solution, because it is. It's just not maybe the cool, sexy thing that we all talk about in conferences. It actually would allow you to use your existing infrastructure and processes to get containers in production, and it will let you play with Docker in, in production and learn all those things you're gonna learn, and it's gonna simplify your OS builds because now that's shifting from the OS into the Docker file. It's gonna let you sort of replace some of your uh, infrastructure code with Docker files. And then, we're, as of this week, we now have sort of these projects that are really about this, right? About changing the, the kernel packaging that happens so that maybe we can get to a point where uh, our VMs are really efficient and it's not a huge deal in, in terms of cost and infrastructure to just use one container and a VM. In fact, this is actually already happening today. On Windows, the Hyper-V containers is a container in a VM, one container. And uh, Linux is doing the same thing with Intel Clear containers, where it's one container in a VM. These are just re reduced kernels and feature sets, and we, we have fancy names for them, but that's what they really are. So I'm giving you permission to do this as an acceptable practice because it works, and it'll allow you to keep a lot of your infrastructure the same. So uh, lastly, the... Uh, other ways you might wanna make a change uh, and make it even faster is um, switching out of what your mindset is around what production is. If you're an IT shop that has a significant number of people, you might have other opportunities to what I would use, call using Docker production internally. And I, I consider production as an ops person anything that someone will complain to me if it goes down. It may not be a customer service uh, thing, it may be internally, but if I'm supporting help desk operations, and I've seen this before, we actually had a scenario where the customer, um, the tech support, were using VMs for these mock environments for the customer's uh, applications. And it turned out that they were just web applications, so turning them into containers and allowing them to spin those up themselves with a little bit of training actually made it a lot easier and it, made it, it allowed us to have a lot of variations so we could have multiple versions on their machines, they didn't have disk problem, disk capacity problems, performance problems. Also, uh, customer demos. I actually had a customer where we had 35 servers per environment, so when we would build out a new environment for a new customer, it took probably half a day. It was a whole lot of automation, but it still took an engineer probably half a day of work to do that. And what was happening is we were getting demo requests. Hey, we got a new customer potentially, can we, uh, can we set up a, spin up a new demo environment? And that would be a half a day work for somebody. So we weren't ready for conduct production containers. And we didn't want to actually change the whole infrastructure, but we were willing to do that for demos. So once we Dockerized everything, we were able to sort of learn and play with production, so to speak, because these would be like three day long productions, right? And then it would go away. And so that was a really great way to uh, get everybody in introduced to Docker on the ops side and figure that stuff out. And my alarm bells start going off anytime I hear someone say, well, in order to do that, we need to wait for someone to deploy or configure a VM. That's right there, a ripe opportunity for playing with Docker and putting it into practice there. Even if it's not a production-esque type system, it'll give you the ops team a workflow to play with that. So thanks for coming. That's the talk. Uh, we're gonna have questions now, but um, I hope you learned something and I hope you get to Docker production soon. How do we do? All right, thank you, Brett. Uh, we're gonna take questions now. If you have a question, please come up to one of these two mics. I'm gonna start us off with a question. So I get this, I get this asked a lot. Uh, let's say I have a legacy application with uh, a database server, a, an application layer, and then a front end layer. Mm -hmm. If I'm pressed for time and I wanna containerize something, uh, I'm curious, what would you containerize first? Uh, probably closest to the customer, probably the web front end. So my assumption would be, it was three parts, right? Database, API, 
uh, uh, just because that's probably going to be the one that's iterating the quickest, and you're going to get the biggest benefit from that, because you're probably not changing your database infrastructure constantly, but you're probably shipping new versions of your API and web. Uh, usually on the teams I'm on, the web is actually iterating faster than the API. So you're going to get the biggest benefit out of it, and web apps, are, hopefully if they're stateless, it's easier to deal with, so, and a swarm. All right, uh, second question. So I think, uh, I think it's great, the, the heuristic of just getting something into production, uh, putting off decisions that you don't need to make early, uh, but obviously there are some decisions you probably want to make up front uh, because it would be costly to make those decisions later. Right. Uh, can, in your opinion, what would be one of those decisions where you should probably put some thought and design into it uh, in the very beginning? Yeah, I think, uh, like I said, the distribution of your host uh, OS, that's a big one. Uh, a lot of people just use the one they have, and then they find out that they, they weren't actually paying attention to their kernel versions, right? They didn't actually need to care so much on their VMs. Maybe they just made that decision three years ago, and they're just using the same uh, version. So, uh, you know, like Red Hat, for instance, I would definitely recommend the latest version of Red Hat so that you get the, all the latest uh, kernel features out of that uh, for Docker. And a lot, of, a lot of shops that use Red Hat, they're usually larger enterprises that are slower on the op side. So we usually, the first thing we do when we're starting a project is we start checking the versions of their infrastructure so it's to see if that needs to be, because that usually is a longer life cycle because maybe they need to buy something there and there's a purchase decision, so. Right. right. Uh, is, there, is there a question over there? Yes. So I just had a question about um, how do you go about dockerizing something like Cassandra that has its own built-in clustering technology um, do you swarm with that? What, what's, do you have any kind of direction uh, for best practice? Cassandra, I don't actually know Cassandra, so. I'm well, or any, any technology that might have its own built-in clustering yeah. that doesn't you know, rely on something like swarm or dark. Right, well that's, gonna, that's really gonna be use case specific, I think. Um, the, I know that there's some apps out there um, I'm trying to think of the, the one I was thinking of that is similar to that scenario where they, they're try, they were basically trying to solve the problem themselves, right? <laughs> because there wasn't all this fancy orchestration. And uh, honestly, you're gonna just have to test it because uh, you know, Swarm is different than classic Swarm and that's different than Kubernetes and they handle things differently. So you might, like overlay networking is really cool, but it also, with virtual IPs and stuff like that, that might affect uh, how these servers uh, deal with each other. If you're, if you're going to do Swarm and you have situations like that, there's actually a DNS little tweak. Uh, you can either turn off the virtual IP and do round robining, or you can use something, uh, it's, I think it's tasks dot the service name, is that right? Uh, that'll give you uh, basically all the IPs for that service. So sometimes when you have to figure out all the IPs in that kind of situation, there's options in Swarm that can get you around that. So, cool, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. I thank you so much for yeah. the great talk. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, the suggestion you said about running one container per VM or the host. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of have that scenario, but how do you explain um, the host being underutilized if you are running one container as compared to like, if, if I have an EC2 instance and I'm not using the whole computing stuff, running right. multiple containers, so how do you explain that? Well, that's sizing, right? I mean, you had that problem when you were in a VM. And so when you just do the containerization on one container per VM, you're not, uh, if, you, if you couldn't deal with that before, if you, like maybe you were on the, the smallest instance size and you just, or you needed something that required a bigger instance size that you were unutilized, that's, you're not gonna solve that problem with, uh, with that scenario. But what it does do for you is it lets you get started faster so that you're not trying, because if you're trying to, if that's your number one problem is capacity performance uh, costs, then uh, maybe, maybe that's not the reason that you're going to end up going into Docker production and you don't, you don't do one container per VM. Okay. But what I see a lot is when there's a mature ops channel, like when they've got all the things figured out and they just basically hit a button and magic happens in the data center. Uh, those, for those teams, trying to do multiple, and it's sort of like a nested performance problem, right? You get multiple containers and multiple VMs on hosts. And so now they have this new paradigm of performance scaling and that becomes a harder challenge for them. So my recommendation is you know, to delay that decision and just do one container per, per VM. So for, for that specific problem, yeah, it's not gonna help. Okay, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah go ahead over there. 
So we're in a traditional VM world today, mm -hmm. and our VMs are immutable infrastructure. We start the instance up, and it knows how to go check out from git config, or from git all of the configuration files, like the MySQL config, let's say. Moving to Docker, you're saying to put that inside the Docker file. What, how does that change if we're using immutable infrastructure? Now, now we're taking things that are today in a Git repository and moving them out of Git into the Docker file. Right. Does that, Boy, st does that still make sense to do in yeah. the case where we have an evolved practice and, and we're doing things in version control? Right. So is it the ops team that controls the, the, those configs today and the developers yes. have the code repo and the ops has the, the, the other repos? That kind yes, of the same, yeah. Uh, so I, we actually had a, that kind of challenge uh, about a year ago with the project. And uh, honestly, the Docker file is a shared responsibility. It's, it's neither one's property. It's, it's a, an agreement on both on the contract. So you might end up with like, like in, in a small organization, the Docker file is just in the repo with the code, right? In a larger organization like that, you might end up with a shared responsibility repository that has the agreements for those Docker files. And then, like for the developers, they would end up having uh, what it would look like for them is like on their local machine, they would have to download all their repos, and then they would download this Dockerfile repo that would ingest, basically work with that code. And then you in production, uh, you, you would be using those Docker files, and you just, in your CI and CD platforms, you would have to get the Docker file over to the code and get them together. So it's probably a simplistic example. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, at some point, you guys are going to have to agree on the Docker file whether or not you keep the SQL configurations in something separate and then just copy them in instead of putting them in the actual Docker file, you're still going to have to deal with the Docker file problem. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, Britt. Hi. Uh, so I got three questions. Uh-oh. Uh I'm going to monetize a lot of things. So, like, can you tell me if there's any latency requirements between, I guess, managers and workers? There is no requirement, no. No, there's no hard requirement. Uh, if it's too, if you don't like how fast it is, then that's probably your requirement. <coughs> Okay. It sounds silly, but we, we did the whole Swarm thing, Swarm 3K over the entire world and different regions, and it, w it worked. Was it fast enough for that ops team? You know, I don't know. There's no, uh, I mean, it's all, it, the latency, the latency between managers, is, uh, between themselves is kind of more important because you're talking about a consensus algorithm that is constantly, every second, checking all the servers. You know, it's small amounts, small size packets, but uh, it's a lot of pa constant packets. So the, the more latency between your managers, the slower they're going to be able to make decisions about who's the leader and who's the, you know, the followers in that sort of set. Got it. Um, the yeah. next question is, I don't want to start a holy war here, but like, do you see a lot of uh, Docker Swarm implementations based on VMs or bare metal? And is there any sort of performance metrics that uh, maybe Docker has done? Um, yeah, so HP, not, not, the white paper that I mentioned, it was specifically to MySQL. And it, so it does talk about that with MySQL, and that would probably be similar in other open source database technologies um, on comparing. The, actually, it compares all three, just VM without containers. But there's another HPE white paper. Uh, shoot me an email. Um, it's on that website. You can get that email on the website. Uh, shoot me an email, and there is another HPE white paper that specifically is only about uh, performance of containers and VMs versus containers and bare metal. The, the cliff notes there is bare metal is awesome. I mean, if you can get there, it's like a win in all situations because now you have less to manage. The performance is amazing, um, especially depending on how many workloads you're putting on that OS. And when you do a lot of containers, uh, you can really see the scheduler uh, do a lot of cool things. I don't see a ton of people going bare metal because, like, we don't have a lot of cloud providers that do it. Joint does it, but it's on smart OS, so that might not, might not work for you. Um, the other ones have it, but it's not a very popular option. So I don't think that's it's because bare metal is bad. It's just people have spent the last 15 years making VMs and creating all this infrastructure around it. And now we're, we're you know, if we're going to go back, it's going to take us a while. So. so and last question. Um, so like in the demo earlier, they're talking about, I guess, uh, Oracle and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, like, so how do you scale services like Oracle? Like just vertically scaling or like, you know, can you do any sort of horizontal scaling with multiple clusters and whatnot? Yeah. Well, that doesn't, I wouldn't say that uh, Docker changes that. That's going to be limited on the application. And like when I did the little one node swarm thing, that, I mean, that happens a lot, because even if you're on a swarm, there's a lot of apps that they've got some sort of persistence thing, or they've got uh, you know, session state issues, and they can't be spread out. They have to be on one node, and that's just like an, an app limitation. Docker's not always going to really help with that. 
uh, even with swarms. So, I mean, it might help automatically recover on a different node if that node fails, and a swarm would help with that. But I, I'm, not, I'm not really an Oracle guy, so I would say whatever the Oracle existing cluster technology is, you could probably do that. I mean, they got it in the store, so it must work on Swarm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's up to the app. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got time for a couple of more questions, and okay. then we'll end the session. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, if you really like the session and the talk, and you have a friend who wants to see it later, uh, please vote for it on the app. We're doing replay sessions all day tomorrow. Uh, and it would really be awesome if we could hear Brett talk some more tomorrow. So two more questions, and then we're good. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have Hi. a scenario where we have uh, two private registries, one effectively for our, our dev environment and the other for our production environment. Is there a way to do replication between those automatically? Uh, and let me, ask, let, me, let me tell you the reason why. Yeah, does, does anyone know the answer to that question? Because I don't know. Okay. I've never heard of it. Specifically, we, we have a uh, um, we have a, a, a decision point where yeah. where a decision maker determines whether or not an image is going to get pushed out to the production repo or not. Right. So um, that's why I was wondering if, if there was some ability. Right. I, I mean, script. honestly, like replication. Uh, this guy's talking about mirroring. I'm not sure what that is, but yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So it sounds like, yeah, there's something in registry that, that can help with that. The other thing I would say is Docker, uh, trusted registry, a part of the Docker EE, it has a, ca a new caching feature. So if like you had one master and you needed to geographically distribute the images, it, it can now do that with caches. Um, and then also, uh, if I had to do it and I didn't know about this, I would probably just set up some sort of autom scripting automation that would, yeah, pull them and push them. But push them, pull them, tag them, and push them, really. Exactly. Is that what you're doing today? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Yeah. Um, so the recommendation that you have about kernels and stuff, uh, we really got bit by that. Uh, we used uh, CentOS 7, the default kernel on that 3.17. Yeah. Uh, the container we had was doing a lot of writes, and we kept seeing uh, memory uh, out of memory errors, and it took like weeks to basically figure out just upgrade the kernel and everything just worked. Uh, it was <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing I, that. I, yeah, I, that that I, happens. Yep. I, it would have been awesome if I just attended this talk in the past. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because I mean, uh, you know, Linux has gotten stable enough in the last decade that a lot of times it, whatever you have is like Apache works on all versions, right? So. Uh, that's, the, that's the thing about Docker, and you know, now when you, when you get into Swarm and you get into the, the overlay networking and you're using uh, IPsec and IP virtual uh, IP addresses and all this stuff, that's just using more kernel features and more kernel drivers, and I'm sure there's, there's issues there that I'm not even aware of, and uh, if you just search the forums for kernel, you end up with a lot of stuff, uh, and, and not the forums, but the, uh, the GitHub issues, so yeah. So, so, so you upgraded the, uh, the CentOS and it solved that problem? Yeah, and, and we switched to Overlay 2. So my question part of this yeah. was basically... Your storage driver, yeah. Uh, storage driver, do you have any recommendation between AUFS, Overlay, and Overlay 2? Um, I have started using Overlay 2 as of like, I think like three months ago. Um, it's also now the default, by the way, uh, on Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows. Uh, if you have an older version from the summer, it started with AUFS, and now if you wiped it clean and reinstalled, it actually does overlay too. That's not really an indication of what you should do in production, but it's, I think, an indication of how Docker is, that's where they're going, and that's where they, I, see they, I think they see the future as an overlay too. So that, that's, on Red Hat, you're going to do uh, device mapper and not overlay too, because that's the official, if you're doing official Red Hat, that's what they invest time in and spend their time on. So. Yeah, overlay two is only available in kernel four plus. So yeah, that's another. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing. True. Right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, though. Yeah, thank you. They go back. All right, I think that's uh, that's all the time we have for questions. If you have questions for Brett, please come up to the front and ask him yourself. Oh, yeah. I think he's free, uh, yes. and he will not be eating lunch if he has a lot of questions. Uh, everyone, thanks for coming. I thank think you. it was a great talk. Uh, come to the next session here if you want to learn about troubleshooting tips from a Docker support engineer. Uh, thank you.